So, so sorry for that. I got mixed up with all my zooms here. Yeah. Okay. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvise Shashanyavadi Paschacha Dejatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So we're on the third canto, chapter 3, the Lord's pastimes out of Vrindavan. Right? We, we studied the Lord's pastimes in Vrindavan. Uddhava is expressed explaining to Vidura the Lord's pastimes. First he explained the pastimes in Vrindavan. Now the third chapter goes into the pastimes out of Vrindavan. Of course, we know that Lord Krishna lived in Vrindavan for the first 11 years of his pastimes. His presence on the planet was in Vrindavan. And then Akrura came and brought him to Mathura. So the first verse in the third chapter begins with Uddhava telling what happened when Krishna came to Mathura. Of course, he had come to Mathura because Kamsa had arranged the wrestling match and uh, Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram came and took part in the wrestling match and defeated the wrestlers, Chanura and Mustika, Toshala, these people. And then Lord Krishna looked at Kamsa. And Kamsa was angry because he saw how Lord Krishna had defeated his wrestlers. So then Kamsa started to give orders. He said, get these two boys, get these two Krishna and Balaram, get them out of here. Throw them out of Mathura. We don't want them here in Mathura. Get them out of here, chase them out. And he said, kill Vasudev and kill Ugrasena. So very uh, nasty, very nasty way Kamsa threatened uh, the Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna's family members. Of course, there are also Kamsa's family members, but Kamsa is a real demon and he's not very favorable towards his family members. Ugrasena, his father, had been put into jail. And Vasudev and Devaki, they'd also, they were also in jail. So, because Kamsa knew that Vasudev had somewhat tricked him, because Vasudev promised that he would deliver the eighth child to Kamsa. So Vasudev had changed the children and the child he delivered was Mother uh, Durga, right? And then, Vasudev, then Narada Muni came and told Kamsa how Vasudev had tricked him and Krishna and Balaram were there in Vrindavan. So after all of Kamsa's demon friends had been killed by Krishna and Balaram, beginning from Putana to Sakatasura to Trinavarta, Bakasura, Agasura, all these different demons one after another, 
they were all killed by Krishna. So Kamsa then had arranged the wrestling match and he thought with the wrestling match he would be able to have Krishna killed. But then he saw Krishna defeat the wrestlers. And so Kamsa says, get, cast them out of here. He didn't say kill them, but he said kill Vasudev and kill Ugrasena because they've cheated me, they've lied to me, they've tricked me. So then Lord Krishna jumped up on the dais and he grabbed, and Kamsa grabbed his sword. Now Bhag Srimad Bhagavatam tells us how Vasudev and Devaki, they were very worried, they were fainting, they were going to faint because they thought, oh no, Kamsa is so big and so strong. He's such a powerful demon. All these demon friends of Kamsa, they were under his control. And the demigods even were afraid of Kamsa. And so Kamsa was really powerful. And Lord Krishna jumped up on the dais where Kamsa was seated. And Kamsa pulled out his sword, but Lord Krishna was not to be intimidated. And Lord Krishna easily defeated him and then he threw Kamsa down into the arena. He threw him off the dais into the arena. And then Lord Krishna jumped down on top of him and began to strike him again and again. And after he had struck him several times, so Kamsa left the body and then Lord Krishna dragged the body, right? It, 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 it's mentioned here also, pulling him along the ground with great triumph. Lord Krishna dragged Kamsa along the ground because he wanted to convince Vasudev and Devaki and all the other people of Mathura that Kamsa was now dead. And that's why he was dragging him. So the people and most of the people in Mathura were joyful because they thought this cancer is a real demon. He'd done so many atrocities. We knew he'd killed all the children, the six sons of Vasudev. So there was, he, he did all kinds of terrible things. He was a real demon. And uh, when he was dead, then the, the, the devoted people were very happy. But the supporters of Kamsa, of course, they're, they're not happy. And Kamsa also had some sons, and the sons came, and Lord Balaram dealt with them. And then there was also Kamsa's mother. <laughs> Kamsa's mother, even the demon like Kamsa, he has a mother, right? Padmavati. Padmavati, and she was sorry that, oh, oh, Krishna's killed my son. Oh, she felt bad that, oh, my son is being killed. But generally, the people of Mathura were happy and they began to rejoice. And the, it, the Srimad Bhagavatam describes how they began, it was like a big kirtan after after Lord Krishna had killed Kamsa, then there was a nice kirtan, all kinds of music was played. Everybody was joyful. Just like if you go to watch, if you go to watch some boxing match or something, you'll see, you know, two people, they get in the ring and they fight each other. And then one person's a winner. And so that person who's a winner all his friends, they're all very happy and they all come in the ring and they're all dancing and they're very happy, My, our friend won. So similarly, when Lord Krishna killed Kamsa, it was like a festival there in Mathura and all the people were rejoicing. Lord Kamsa was killed. So this is the first incident which Uddhava describes. The Lord's, of course, before Krishna killed Kamsa, Krishna had to deal with different people. He met, first of all, he met Kamsa's laundry man, 
when he first came to Mathura. Kamsa's laundry man, his dobi, <laughs> he, Lord Krishna had come from Vrindavan with Lord Balaram, and they saw Kamsa's laundry man with so many nice pieces of cloth. And so Krishna and Balaram were coming from the countryside, from Vrindavan. They didn't have such nice cloth. So they thought, they asked, Lord Krishna asked the washerman, that, oh, this, this looks like very nice cloth. Could you give some of that cloth for me? And the laundry man became offended and he chastised Lord Krishna and said, this belongs to King Kamsa. He'll have you punished if you talk like this. So, Lord Krishna was not impressed with this laundry man. And Lord Krishna, just using his hand, he knocked off his head, and then all the devotees, they, they could all take some of the nice cloth and decorate themselves. Lord Krishna always likes to be dressed in nice clothing. Just like when we dress the deities, this is very pleasing to Lord Krishna. In Vrindavan pastimes, we see Lord Krishna, is, even though he's in Vrindavan, the countryside, he liked to be dressed very nicely and he would decorate himself. So when he came to Mathura, he took the opportunity to take some of that cloth from Kamsa's laundry man. We are told that that laundry man of Kamsa had a bad past, that he had been in Lord Rama's pastime. In the past, in the, in the Lord's previous incarnation as Lord Ramachandra, it is said that Lord Rama would go out into the city of Ayodhya and he would go in disguise and secretly he would go around and he would listen to what people were saying about him. So it happened that one day Lord Rama was going around the city of Ayodhya in disguise and he heard one barber who was chastising his wife. His wife had gone away with another man and then came back. So when she came back, the barber told her, I'm not taking you back. He said, Lord Rama may take his wife back after she's been with another man, but I'm not taking you back. So when Lord Rama heard these words, he was very affected and he understood that this is not good. If people have some doubt about my character and about the character of Mother Sita, so when he went back to the palace, he sent Mother Sita off to the ashram of uh, Valmiki. And uh, Mother Sita, of course, was already pregnant at that time. She had already conceived. And even though she was in that condition, Lord Rama sent her off to the ashram of Valmiki because Lord Rama was very concerned about public opinion. So this barber who had spoken these foolish words, uh, criticizing Lord Ramachandra, this barber took birth as the, the laundry man of Kamsa. And Lord Krishna then approached him for the cloth and when he didn't give it, Lord Krishna liberated him. He gave him Sayuja Mukti into the spiritual world. So that is uh, one pastime which took place when Lord Krishna came to Mathura. Of course then when Lord Krishna, he also met Sudama, the florist, and he met Kubja, and they were very nice. And they gave everything, they offered everything. Sudama gave flor beautiful garlands and Kubja she gave all the sandalwood paste she was grinding for Kamsa. And then Lord Krishna, when, when he went to the arena, then Kamsa had that elephant, Kuvala Yapida, there. The, this big elephant, with a, it was a very ferocious elephant. And the keeper of the elephant was a friend of Kamsa. 
And so it was arranged that this elephant would attack Lord Krishna. And so when it attacked Lord Krishna, then Lord Krishna had some fun and games with it. He would hide behind the back of the elephant and he would trick, or, trick, trick the elephant. And the elephant, elephants can't see behind them. And so Lord Krishna finally killed that elephant as well as the person taking care of the elephant. So then he also, of course, Lord Krishna also broke the bow. There was a big bow there. And Lord Krishna picked up the bow and broke that bow. And then he came into the arena for the wrestling match. And the wrestling match, of course, was very unfair. That These wrestlers were built like mountains, very solid. And Krishna and Balaram were young boys with soft skin. And the people of Mathura were thinking, this is not fair. They were watching and they were feeling so much love for Krishna and Balaram. And they were thinking, this wrestling match has not been arranged properly, not fair. But they said, the wrestler said, oh, we heard that in Vrindavan you're always wrestling. You cowherd boys, you like to wrestle with each other. So we know you're very expert in wrestling. And so then they, they began to wrestle. And Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, they quickly dealt with these wrestlers and sent them to, they gave them also impersonal liberation. And then they dealt with Kamsa. And they dealt with Kamsa. And that was the real purpose. That was one of the real missions of the Lord to get rid of Kamsa, because he was instigating so much irreligion in Mathura. So with the death of Kamsa, everyone was rejoicing. And then Lord Krishna could free his parents from the jail, Vasudev and Devaki. They were released from the, their prison, and Lord Krishna is apologizing to them that he hadn't been able to serve them. And then the next pastime which Uddhava talk, talks about comes in text number two. We hear about how Vasudeva and Devaki, they wanted Krishna and Balaram to go for uh, their spiritual education. They should get their education. So they, it was arranged they would go to Sandipani Muni's ashram. Sandipani Muni had an ashram at Avantipur. Avantipur today is called Ujjain. Hmm. And so Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram were sent to Avantipur, to the ashram of Sandipani Muni. And Sandipani Muni taught them all the 60, 64 different arts, all kinds of different arts. They're all mentioned. If you look in Prabhupada's Krishna book, or in the Srimad Bhagavatam, you will see all the different arts are mentioned, all the different things which they learn to do, amazing things, as well as the Vedic philosophy, they also learned that too. So they learned everything, six, all the six, 64 arts, and they stayed there 64 days. And during that time, when Lord Krishna was staying there, of course, Sudama, the Brahman, was there. So Sudama, the Brahman, was a friend of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna, he likes very much the Brahmanas. Namo Brahmana Devaya, go Brahmana Hitayacha. Lord Krishna is the friend of the Brahmanas. So Sudama Brahman was there in the ashram of Sandipani Muni, and he became the friend of Lord Krishna. And it happened that one day, Lord Krishna and Sudama had gone into the forest to collect firewood for Lord Krishna, for the ashram, for, or for Sandipani Muni rather. They were collecting firewood because in the, they have to do yagya and they use wood also, maybe use wood also for cooking. But certainly they have to do the yagya every day. The brahmanas, they'll, every morning, every evening, they'll do Agnihotri. 
so they need wood. So Lord Krishna, along with Sudama, had gone into the forest to collect dry wood. But when they were in the forest, that, uh, then the sky became very dark and a big storm came, a heavy storm and with a lot of wind. And it, it rained and then they, they couldn't find their way back to the ashram. So Sudama and Lord Krishna ended up staying the whole night in the, ash, in, in the forest. They couldn't find their way back to the ashram. And it was evening when they went to get the wood. So it became dark and they, they spent the whole night in the forest. And then the next morning, early in the morning, Sandipani Muni came there with all of the other students looking what had happened to Sudama and Krishna. And when they found them, then Sudama Muni was, was so kind to them and he thanked them so much. He, he said that, you've undergone all of this austerity just for me. He said, you are the real disciples. When you accept a spiritual master, you should be willing to undergo austerities on behalf of the spiritual master. And we should even be willing to give up our life for the pleasure of the spiritual master. So Sandipani Muni glorified Lord Krishna and Sudama Brahman that you are the real disciples. You've understood the relationship between the teacher, the spiritual teacher and the disciple. You've taken all this austerity just to bring the wood for our ashram. So Sandipani Muni gave a blessing to them. He blessed them that may you, that the, the, the Vedic mantras which you learn will remain ever fresh, both in this world and in the next, that they will remain ever fresh for you. The example is given just like if you have food if, it's, if the food's been cooked like three hours before, then it doesn't have much taste anymore because it was already cooked three hours ago. So it's not really very relishable. And sometimes we see people come to Krishna consciousness and somehow, you know, they may lose their enthusiasm which they had initially. In the beginning, they may be very eager and enthusiastic, everything is new, but somehow, in course of time, you know, their mind goes back to material thoughts, they think about sense gratification, and they lose their enthusiasm for chanting the Vedic mantras. But here we see Sandipani Muni giving the blessing to Lord Krishna and Sudama. He said that, may the, these Vedic mantras which I've been teaching you, may they remain ever fresh for you. So that's, that's important. We should want that kind of blessing that the Vedas will, the Vedic mantras will remain fresh for us. We want to always appreciate them and recite them regularly. So Sudama was there. He was the classmate of Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram stayed there. We said, 64 days and then after they'd learned everything then they wanted to give Guru Dakshin to, Sudam, to Sandipani Muni and they asked him what kind of Dakshin can we give you? So Sandipani Muni consulted with his wife and then they came back and told Lord Krishna that some time ago our son died he had gone to the sea, he'd gone to the sea, and he, somehow he drowned in the sea. So could you bring him back from Yamara? Could you bring him back to life for us? We understand you're not ordinary students, so we're asking this special request of you. So when Lord Krishna was asked like that, then Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram first First they went to the seaside, they went to the beach where the sun had died. And they asked the god of the ocean, 
where is this boy? And so the god of ocean said, well, there's a demon lives in the ocean here. The demon is Panchajanya, Panchajana, Panchajana. And he is the one who took that boy, the demon. He's living in the ocean. So Lord Krishna went into the ocean and he found this demon, Panchajana, and he killed him. And the, from the body of this demon, a conch shell had grown. So Lord Krishna took that conch shell, the Panchajanya, Lord Krishna's conch shell. The demon is called Panchajana and the conch shell is Panchajanya. So Lord Krishna took the conch shell, and, but he, he couldn't find the boy. He was not in the belly of the demon. Lord Krishna thought maybe the demon had swallowed him, eaten him or something, but he couldn't find him. And so then he went to Yamaraj. After killing the demon, then he went to Yamaloka. He went to uh, Yama's capital, the capital of Yamaraj. Uh, what's the name of that capital? Do you remember? Lord Yamaraj. Samyamani. Huh? Samyamani, right, thank you Prabhu, yes, Samyamani. He went there to Samyamani and he uh, asked Yamaraj, you, have you got the son of my teacher? I want to take him back. And so Yam, oh first of all, when Lord Krishna went there to Samyamani, he blew the conch shell, he blew that Panchajanya conch shell very loudly. Now that conch shell is very interesting. Just by hearing that sound, it destroys sinful reactions. And there are scriptural verses which describe how different places in hell that all the people become liberated if they hear the conch shell. It said even in Kumbi Pakaloka, Kumbi Pakaloka is where they're cooking the people in oil. They cook the sinful people in oil. But when they hear the the sound of the conch shell, they stop cooking. They don't cook anymore. And all the people get liberated. This, and it said this demon, Pancha Jana, he is actually some, it's like Jayan Vijay. Jayan Vijay were cursed to become demons. So Pancha Jana, he was also from the spiritual world, but he was somehow cursed to take this demon form. And Lord Krishna then killed him, liberated him, and took the conch shell. And therefore, when that conch shell is sounded, it's very powerful and very purifying and takes away all sinful reactions. Even from people in hell, they get delivered and they can go to the spiritual world. So Lord Krishna blew his conch shell and Lord Yamaraj came out and saw Krishna and Balaram and offered obeisances and prayers to them. And then they, Lord Krishna told him, I want the son of my teacher. And Lord Krishna was promptly delivered with the son of the teacher, Sandipani Muni's son. And Lord Krishna brought him back to Avantipur. And then Lord Krishna and Balaram said to the Sandipani Muni, they said, is there anything else? What, what else can we do for you? Would you like another benedict, another boon? But Sandipani Muni said, no, no, no. They said, this is enough. Thank you very much. He said, just to have you two as disciples, that is the greatest blessing. So he was very happy to get his son back. So this is the pastime which took place there with Lord Krishna and going to the Sandipani Muni's ashram and bringing the sun back from Yamaloka. Just a few points in the purport. Uh, the Lord is constitutionally well versed in all the Vedas and yet to teach by example that everyone must Want, must go to learn the Vedas from an, an authorized teacher and must satisfy the teacher by service and reward. He himself adopted 
this system. So Lord Krishna personally teaches us by his example. He takes a spiritual master and he goes and studies. And further on, the Lord is not therefore an ingrate to anyone who renders him some sort of service. So Sandipani Muni had rendered some service to him because Lord Krishna had gone there and learned everything from him. So Lord Krishna is not an ingrate. He's grateful for the service which Sandipani Muni had given him. And that's why he went and brought the dead son back from Yamaloka. So this is one of Lord Krishna's wonderful pastimes that he could bring back a dead son. Oh, somebody dies, could you ever imagine bringing them back from Yamaraj, bringing them back? Who could do that? Only the Supreme Lord can do that. All right. And in text three, we hear about Lord Krishna and his marriage to Rukmini, the daughter of King Bhishmaka. And of course, Rukmini, her marriage was supposed to be arranged by her older brother, Rukma. And he, the older brother, he didn't like Lord Krishna. He was a friend of Sishupala. So he'd arranged for Sishupal to marry Rukmini. And Rukmini was just so beautiful. She was just so attractive. It's mentioned here, Prabhupada describes here, uh, as, a, a, as attractive as fortune itself, because she was as valuable as gold, both in color and in value. Of course, Rukmini is the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, and she comes, she's actually the, meant to be the consort of Lord Krishna. So while Rukmini's marriage was being arranged, Rukmini had heard about Lord Krishna from Narada Muni, and so she wrote a letter to Lord Krishna asking Lord Krishna to come and kidnap her. And she even gave the details of where Lord Krishna could come and what time he should come and how he could kidnap her. So she really helped a lot. <laughs> and, and she gave the letter to a Brahmana, and the Brahmana went there to Dwarka and delivered the letter to Lord Krishna. And at that time, there's a nice conversation between the Brahmana and Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna, first of all, when the Brahmana came there, Lord Krishna inquired from the Brahmana how he was. And he said, are you following the religious principles? Are you satisfied? And there's a nice explanation that it's very important that one should feel satisfied in his devotional service. That if we're not satisfied, then we won't, then it's not devotional service anymore. We should feel that we're, we're doing the right thing in rendering service to Krishna. It's especially the duty of a Brahmana to be satisfied. A Brahmana's business is not to simply get wealth or to acquire power or fame or anything. The Brahmana's duty is simply to follow the religious principles. So Lord Krishna was concerned that this Brahmana was doing everything properly. And so Lord Krishna got the letter from Rukmini and he heard it. And he understood, yes, he thought, yes, this is a nice plan, nice idea. So Lord Krishna also went to the marriage ceremony. Everyone was coming for Rukmini's marriage, thinking she's going to marry Sishupal. And Sishupal had brought all of his big demon friends. Jara Sanda was there, and Salva was there, and Dantavakra was there all big powerful demons and they were vowing if Krishna comes here we're not we will never let him interfere he will try to stop the marriage we will stop him 
So Lord Krishna did come there. And when Lord Krishna came there, then Rukmini's father was very pleased. Actually, as Prabhupada describes in the purport, Rukmini's father, King Bhishmaka, he wanted his daughter to marry Lord Krishna. And when Lord Krishna came there to their kingdom, all of the people, they thought, Rukmini should marry Krishna. Why is she going to marry Sishupal? Krishna would be a much better husband for Rukmini. But because she had this older brother, the older brother had very strong influence. We see just like Duryodhan had influence over Dhritarashtra, so Rukmi, Rukmini's older brother, he had influence over her father and he was arranging Rukmini's marriage. But Lord Krishna has come and Lord Krishna is there and but he waits for the proper time and when Rukmini is going to worship the, come, or coming back from the Durga temple worship before making the marriage vows with Sishupal, at that time Lord Krishna comes and takes her and said, Lord Krishna took her just like a lion would take the, the, the animal from a herd of, from a pack of jackals. You know, jackals are little insignificant creatures. A big lion comes, what can the jackal do? And so Lord Krishna was like that. He was like the lion taking the beast from all the jackals. But when Jarasandha and, Bish and, the, and the, the other friends of Sishupa, when they saw it, they said, oh, look at this. this, this he's a jackal taking from, all the, from the lion. We're the lions and he's, take, he's a jackal. He's coming and taking what's not for him. And of course, they tried to fight. But Lord Balaram had come with an army. Lord Balaram had come with an army and Lord Balaram revoked them. They, they couldn't stop Lord Krishna taking away Rukmini. Even without Lord Balaram, Lord Krishna could take her away. So this is the, how Lord Krishna got his first wife, Rukmini. And uh, that, that is uh, mentioned here. Of course, it was a big blow to Sishupal. Because Sishupa was always a competitor to Lord Krishna. Sishupa was also very opulent and very powerful, but he couldn't equal Lord Krishna. So he was always just a little bit behind Krishna. And here again, he, his own marriage was thwarted by Lord Krishna. All right. We'll go ahead. Text number four. We hear about Nagnajit, Nagnajiti, Nagnajiti. So her father, he wanted the man who's going to marry his daughter, that you have to tie up these bulls. He had these very ferocious bulls and seven bulls, you had to deal with them. They, their noses were not pierced. So there was a competition, who could get Nagnajiti for a, a, a wife, you had to first of all tie up these seven bulls. So Lord Krishna came and for him, not a very big problem. Lord Krishna of course can expand himself seven times. <laughs> and he could tie tied up the bulls and then he took the hand of the princess. But the other princes, the other competitors were not happy and they challenged him. It's not fair, you, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't get it. <laughs> and there was a big fight, but Lord Krishna defeated all of them and he took her for a, a queen. Lord Krishna has eight principal queens actually. And so the main ones we hear are Rukmini and then Next one is uh, Satyavati, but we hear the next pastime, which involves uh, Satyabhama rather, Satyabhama, 
it involves Lord Krishna going to Indraloka. Lord Krishna took his queen with him, Satyabhama with him, to Indraloka. What had happened was uh, this demon Narak, Narakasur, he had stolen different items. He had stolen the earrings of Mother Aditi and he would stolen the umbrella of Varuna and he'd taken different things which didn't belong to him, which were meant for heaven. So Indra, Lord Indra came to Lord Krishna and complained about it and told him about this demon Narak. That this demon Narakasura was very powerful. Now Indra didn't know how to deal with him himself. He came to Lord Krishna for help, appealing to Lord Krishna that he should go there and do something about him. So Lord Krishna decided to take Satyabhama with him. And he took Satyabhama with him and he went first of all to the kingdom where Narakasura was residing. And he was protected by a demon called Mura. The Mura demon was living there in the water surrounding the, the kingdom. And he, this Mura demon had five heads. So when Lord Krishna came there, the Mura demon tried to stop him. So Lord Krishna had to kill him first. And then the sons of the Mura demon, seven sons all came and they all fought with Lord Krishna. Krishna killed all of them. Now the, the, the problem was, why did Lord Krishna take Satyabhama there to see this kind of uh, fight? One reason was, which is told by us to the, by the Acharyas, was that this Narakasura's mother had been given a blessing that Lord Krishna would not kill her son unless the mother gave permission. The mother, the mother of Narakasura was Bhumi, the mother of the, the, the deity of the earth. Mother Bhumi, and she had conceived the child, it said, at the time when she was picked up from the bottom of the universe by Lord Varaha. So Narakasura was the son of Bhumi and Lord Varaha, and Bhumi had been told that the Lord would not kill her unless she gave permission. So Lord Krishna brought Satyabhama with him because Bhumi is an expansion from Satyabhama. So when Lord Krishna was fighting, he had, he, after killing Mura, then Narakasura came out himself to fight. And Narakasura had many elephants. These elephants were actually from the Airavata elephant. And they were, they were white and they had four tusks. They each had four tusks and they were white in color. They come from, descended from the Airavata elephant from the milk ocean, turned from the milk ocean. So this demon Narakasura was really powerful. But when he came out to fight, then Satyabhama saw that he was really a demon and she said to Lord Krishna, she said to Krishna, oh, kill him quickly, kill him quickly. And so with the permission of Satyabhama, Lord Krishna then dealt with Narakasura and killed him. And so after he killed Narakasura, then Bhumi, the mother, she came with the earrings to give them to Lord Krishna, to return them. That this is Mother Aditi's earrings and this is the umbrella of Varuna. And there was also the, the top of a mountain where the demigods reside. So she gave them back, everything back to Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna then took Satyabhama with him to go and see Mother Aditi in the heavenly planets. And at that time, they gave Mother Aditi the earrings and at that time they took a Parijata tree. They took the Parijata tree because earlier Narada Muni had given a flower to Rukmini and this Parijata flower is so fragrant 
that there's nothing like it on earth. That it's so fragrant that even the bees from the heavenly planets come to get the nectar from this flower. So Satyabhama was a little bit envious that Rukmini had the Parijata flower. And Lord Krishna could understand Satyabhama's feelings. So Lord Krishna told Satyabhama, don't worry, I'll get you a whole tree. She's only got a flower. I'll get you a tree. So Lord Krishna, when they were there in heaven, they took a Parijata tree. But it's described here uh, that when they took the tree, the wives of Indra were very upset and they complained to Indra that, oh, look, they're taking our tree. This tree should belong here in heaven. You should not, and they complained to Indra, you should not let them take that tree away from heaven. And so because of his wives, like his, Indra has some, probably more than one wife, one main wife is Sachi, but the wives, the ladies were complaining. So Indra began to argue with Krishna and then it became a, became a fight. He tried to stop Krishna from taking the Parijata tree. But Lord Krishna defeated him, right? From Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada writes, Indra's wives inspired him to run after the Lord to fight. And Indra, because he was a hand-packed husband and also a fool, listened to them and dared to fight with Krishna. He was a fool on this occasion because he forgot that everything belongs to the Lord. Yeah. Krishna is not taking the Parijata tree just to satisfy Satyabhama, but he wants to teach Indra that it, everything belongs to him, not to Indra. Some more points in the purport. Indra thought the king was a henpecked husband who only by the will of his wife Satyabhama took away the, par the, the property of heaven. And therefore he thought that Krishna could be punished. <laughs> we see just how everything becomes reversed. That we see the faults in others, we don't see our own fault. Indra was thinking, oh, Krishna's a henpecked husband, he's taking that tree for Satyabhama. He didn't see his own fault. <laughs> this is a tendency. We often see, have this problem that we see the faults in others, we don't see our own faults. A, a bit more in the purport. He was not, therefore, attached to Satyabhama because she was a beautiful wife, but he was pleased with her devotional service and thus wanted to reciprocate the unalloyed devotion of his devotee. So we're seeing in these pastimes how Krishna reciprocates with his devotees. We saw how he reciprocated with Sandipani Muni and with Rukmini and now with Satyabhama. So Krishna is Bhaktavatsala. He reciprocates with the loving feelings of his devotees. He's not ungrateful for any service rendered by his devotees. However small it may be, Krishna takes no. Okay, going ahead. We, Pastime num uh, text number six, we hear about Narakasura, described here, the son of Daritri, the earth. And Daritri, the earth. Okay, I said Bhumi, same, no difference. Um, so, Narakasura tried to grasp the whole sky, and for this he was killed by the Lord in a fight. His mother then prayed to the Lord. This led to the return of the kingdom to the son of Narakasura. 
And thus the Lord entered the house of the demon. Prabhupada's purport, an atheist is called a demon, and it is a fact that even a person born of good parents can turn into a demon by bad association. Birth is not always the criterion of goodness, unless and until one is trained in the culture of goodness, association, one cannot become good. So unless one is trained in the culture of good, association, one cannot become good. Can you think of anybody who was born in good parents but became a demon? We know, of course, people born in demon families who became devotees. We have like Prahlad and Bali. But what about people born in, in demon... Kamsa oh, Maharaj? Kamsa? Well... Kamsa is a little special case. What happened actually, I heard that his mother, Padmavati, was raped. He was not actually the son of Ugrasena, although he was born in that family, but he was not actually the, the son. He was it was a demon who came and raped uh, Padmavati, and that's how she gave birth to Kamsa, that he was a demon. So that kind of birth. You, you cannot expect to get a very good soul. Mm. Yeah, he was born in a Brahmana family. I don't know the details, who the parents were. No, no, Ravana's mother was not a very good person. She was not very good, huh? Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah the, Shishupala. Shishupala. The son of Damagosh. Well, well, Damagosh also, he's not really a devotee because he's also, he's come, he came there also for the wedding of his son. He wanted his son to marry Rukmini. Mm. I, was, I was thinking maybe like Karn, Karna, his, his parents, you know, of course he didn't know who his parents were. But then, well, then he was brought up in the other family. But his actual parent was Kunti and, and Surya Bhagwan, um, the sun god. But then, of course, he was adopted. He was an adopted child. And then he fell into association with Duryodhana and others. Who? Bali, Bali. Bali? Bali Maharaj, you mean? Uh, no, Maharaj. Sugriva's brother, Bali. Oh, Sugriva's brother, Bali. Hmm. Well, that... There... That's... Uh, monkeys, right? Yes, Maharaj. Mm-hmm. I'd like to ask you three sons. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, right? Advaita Acharya had three sons who were, three sons were devotees and three, th three sons, they were asara. They were useless. They gone, they went off to impersonalism <laughs> or voidism. That's a nice one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, it's a good point that association is very important and uh, just being born in a good family doesn't necessarily mean that you will also be good. And sometimes we have very good parents and the child goes up very bad. And so you have to have the culture of good association. That, and that we get in the Krishna consciousness movement. Our Krishna consciousness movement is meant to provide that kind of good association which will help people to become good. And we, we see, actually, people come. We have very bad faults, very bad qualities before becoming devotees, but somehow we become transformed by 
the good association. By association. Association. Prabhupada said association is 98% of our Krishna consciousness. It's so important. You now sometimes people say, oh, I, I just want to stay home and read. I don't want to go to temple. I don't like to associate with devotees. But it's very important. It's important. It's not really recommended just stay home and read on your own. We need to get the association. You have to be with devotees. And in the association of devotees, cultivate the good qualities. Okay, so the Narakasura, more about Narakasura is described because uh, Lord Krishna went into the house and he's the palace of the Narakasura and he saw all of these daughters of so many great kings had been kept there. And when Lord Krishna entered, it's described here, they looked upon Lord, Lord Krishna, looked upon him with eagerness, joy and shyness and offered to be his wives. <laughs> so this is how Lord Krishna got his 16,100 wives. He had his eight principal wives and this is 16,100 wives. And so Krishna saved them because nobody else would touch them, nobody else wanted them, because they had been touched by another man. So in the Vedic culture, you know, nobody wants second-hand property, and so these women, these girls are in a very unfortunate condition, because Narakasura had taken them, and he was keeping them there, and they had no husband. So Lord Krishna came, and he accepted all of them as his wives. Right. So, going ahead, text number eight. All these princesses were lodged in different apartments and the Lord simultaneously assumed different bodily expansions, exactly matching each and every princess. He accepted their hands in perfect rituals by his internal potency. So very wonderful how Lord Krishna could expand himself, not once or twice, but 16,100 times for each of these ladies. And when he took them back to Dwarka, then the marriage was also done like that, also. That there were, there were 16,108 marriages performed simultaneously. And the Lord's parents, they, like Mother Devaki, she came to each and every one of the marriages. So by Lord Krishna's internal potency, Vasudev and Devaki, they also expanded themselves so that they could come to each and every one of the Lord's marriages. So this is the Lord's internal potency. Right? Prabhupada talks about it here in the purport. He talks about, uh, although he is primeval, the oldest person, oh, that, that's the verse from Brahma Samhita. By his internal potency, the Lord can expand himself into various personalities of Swayam Prakash, and again into Prabhav and Vaibhav forms. So, Swayam Prakash, that is the Lord's the, the initial form is Swayam Rupa, and from Swayam Rupa comes the Swayam Prakash. And all the different incarnations of the Lord, which appear in the universe, they all come from the Swayam Prakash. And so then the Lord has his different forms, which are called, some are called, some are from Prabhav, and some are Vaibhav. So I, I looked up the details about this. Prabhav. The Prabhav is describing, uh, this is the full potency of the Lord in his different, uh, in relation to his pastimes. Prabhav is the full potency. But there's two types of Prabhav. One is eternal and one is temporary. Some of the temporary forms are forms like Mohini and Hamsa and Shukla. And the Vaibhav, these are partially potent. Prabhav is fully potent forms, 
and Vaibhav is partially potent and this is in relation to the excellencies of the Lord. So I'm not quite sure how to distinguish the difference. What the Prabhav is in relation to his potencies and Vaibhav in relation to his ecstasy, excellencies. And so some of the Vaibhav forms include forms like Nara, Narayan Rishi, and Kurma, and Matsya, Prishni Garba, Vamana, these different things. If you want to get the details, then you can con con consult Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Leela, Chapter 2, Text 97. And there's a nice purport there where Prabhupada talks about the Lord's different expansions and different potent uh, forms which come about by his internal potency. All right. Mm. Oh, we hear about Vaibhavilas, Vaibhavilas forms of the Lord. This means the Lord's forms for his pastimes, for this particular pastime, taking 16,100 wives. This is the Lord's pastime. And then it's mentioned, text 9, how the Lord beget, begot in each of them ten offspring with exactly his own qualities. And so you can see why Dwarka became such a big place. 16,100 queens and each queen had ten offspring. So there's 161,000 children. And so many, there were so many brahmanas and there were so many people. Dwarka became a huge metropolis. Okay, we'll go ahead to text number 10. And the next pastime we hear about is Kalayavana. Well, not only Kalayavana, but the king of Magadha, who is Jarasandha, and Salva. They all attacked the city of Mathura. But when the city was encircled by their soldiers, the Lord refrained from killing them personally, just to show the power of his own men. So Lord Krishna didn't personally kill Kalayavna or Jarasandha. Lord Krishna, for Kalayavna, Kalayavna came, he was chasing Krishna. This was when Lord Krishna did his ranchor activity. Ranchor activity, he, he first of all transferred all the people from Mathura, he transferred them to Dwarka to protect them from all the people who were trying to invade Mathura. They were all attacking at the one time, so Lord Krishna saw great danger for the people of Mathura, so he transferred them at that time, everyone, to Dwarka, and then he came back himself and he confronted them. But he didn't fight them. He just left the battlefield. And <laughs> that's why uh, Jarasandha, he was thinking, uh, this event actually happened before the marriage of Rukmini. Uh, because it describes that at the time of Rukmini's marriage, Jarasandha is trying to uh, console Sishupala because Sishupal has seen Rukmini being taken by Krishna, so he knows he can't have her now for a wife. And so Sishupal, uh, Jarasandha tries to pacify Sishupal. He said, he said, you know, don't worry. He said, you know, he said, you know, I fought Krishna 17 times and he defeated me 17 times, but the 18th time I defeated him. <laughs> so he's referring to this incident, actually. So, Jarasandha was telling Sishupal that, don't give up, keep, keep trying, one day you'll be victorious. He said, I was defeated 17 times, but the 18th time I was victorious. <laughs> he was trying to pacify Sishupal. Of course, Jarasandha didn't defeat Krishna the 18th time. But what happened was, well, Krishna left the battlefield 
and he went up a mountain and he went into the cave and Jar um, Muchi Kunda's in the cave. So Muchi Kunda's in the cave and uh, Kala Yavana is chasing him. Ch Kala Yavana, he was born, he had a benediction that they would terrorize the Yadu dynasty. Because what happened, Garga Acharya got insulted. The, he had a, some brother-in-law of Garga Acharya had insulted him. And when he was insulted by his brother-in-law, all the Yadu kings laughed at him. So Garga Acharya put a curse on the Yadu dynasty that they would be terrorized by a demon. So this Kala Yavana is the one who was terrorizing the Yadu dynasty. So Lord Krishna didn't kill him, but he took him up the mountain. Kalayavna came chasing Krishna up the mountain. He went into the cave and Muchikunda was laying sleeping there. So he kicked, he thought it was Krishna and he kicked him. And Muchikunda opened his eyes and then from his eyes fire came out and Kalayavna was burned to ashes because Muchikunda had that benediction that if anybody woke him up, then he would burn them to ashes. Muchi Kunda was actually a, a devotee. He had been fighting for the demigods in the higher planets, and he'd become very tired. And so he asked the demigod. The, the demigods wanted to give him a benediction, and that was the benediction he wanted, and that if anybody wakes me up, they should be burned to ashes. So. Kalayavana was burned to ashes. And Jarasandha, he was not killed by Krishna either, but he was killed by Krishna's devotee, Bhima. With the help of Lord Krishna, of course, it was Lord Krishna who told Bhima how to kill Jarasandha. They'd been fighting. Each well, first of all, Lord Krishna came there with Bhima and Arjuna to Jarasandha. And they came disguised as brahmanas. And Jarasandha was such a king that he liked to give charity to the brahmanas. He liked to follow the Vedic culture because he knew it was good for him to give charity to the brahmanas. So they came there disguised and they asked Jarasandha, yes, we want charity. He said, what do you want? And actually Jarasandha could see that these three that they couldn't be brahmanas because the Bhima and Arjuna and Lord Krishna, they're, first of all, their voices are like thunder. They speak very powerfully. They don't speak like brahmanas. Brahmanas are learned and gentle. Vidya Vinaya. Vidya Vinaya is the qualities of the brahmana, to be learned and gentle. But Krishna, Bhima, Arjuna, they're not Brahmana. They, they're, they speak very powerfully, especially Bhima. And, and their, their shoulder was also marked where they've been carrying the bow. They carry their weapons and they could see, he could see the marks on their shoulders. Anyway, Jarasandha thinks they've come as Brahmanas, I should give them charity. So he said, what do you want? No, he said, no, we want a battle. Then they under, he understood, this is Bhima, and this is Arjuna, and this is uh, Lord Krishna. So he said, I'm not going to fight Krishna. He said, Krishna already ran away from the battlefield before me. I'm not going to fight him now. He's a coward. And he said, Arjun, he's not strong enough. He won't be a good battle for me. He said, I'll fight with Bhim. Bhim looks like he'll give me a good fight. And so this is the Kshatriya nature. We, we see the spirit of Jarasandha, that he picked a battle with Bhim because he knew it would be a good fight. I'll have a good fight. Fight somebody who is equal. He didn't want to fight somebody who would be easy for him. He wanted a good fight. They had the real Kshatriya mood. And so they fought for many days with each other and Bhima couldn't get the better of him. But then Lord Krishna told him, how Jarasandha is joined. He, he got that name Jarasandha, joined by the witch Jara. And Lord Krishna picked up a twig and split it in middle, down the middle. And so Bhima did like that. He grabbed a hold of one foot of 
Jarasandha and knocked him down and then picked up the other leg and ripped him right down the middle. He ripped him right into two halves. Oh, what an end, what a fate. And this way Jarasandha was killed. But not by Krishna. Krishna gets his devotees to do it. He engages people. How about Salva? How was Salva killed? Anybody know? I think Krishna did that, right? It's interesting here because it said Salva also attacked Mathura, but we don't hear that in any other place. We don't hear about Salva also coming attacking at that time. Anybody know anything? How did Salva come attack? Have you heard this? Okay, so in the purport, actually the Lord descended at the request of Brahma in order to kill all the undesirables of the world. In, in order to kill all the undesirables of the world, but to divide the share of glory, he sometimes engaged his devotees to take the credit. What he wants to do himself by his transcendental plans, he executes through his confidential devotees. That is the way of the Lord's mercy towards his pure, unalloyed devotees. All right, so going ahead, text 11, more demons who were killed by Krishna and some were killed by Balaram, some he kills and some are killed by Balaram. Text 12, all the kings, both the enemies and those on the side of your fighting nephews, be killed in the battle of Kurukshetra. All those kings were so great and strong that the earth seemed to shake as they traversed the war field. So everyone died, we know, from the Kala Rup. Lord Krishna, Shona Arjuna, everyone's going to die except for you Pandavas. Everyone will be killed. There will be nobody left. It's all going to be finished like that. And then Uddhava also brings up about the killing of Duryodhana. Duryodhan was bereft of his fortune and duration of life because of the intricacy of ill advice given by Karna, Dushasan and Shobal. So here, Uddhava is speaking, he's saying that Karna was a bad influence on Duryodhan and Dushasan. Dushasan and Karna, they're blamed for influencing Duryodhan. It's like Duryodhana is actually not such a bad person, but he got influenced by Karna and Dushasan. And we know about the, the death of Duryodhana, that at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra, all of the great generals of the Kauravas had been killed, Dronacharya had been killed, and then Bhishma had been fallen on the bed of arrows. So Duryodhana is left, and he has to fight with Bhim. And they're fighting again a long time. And Lord Balaram, of course, he's a very good friend of Duryodhana. And he's also a friend of the Pandavas. And he didn't like that they were fighting with each other. Lord Balaram said, this is not good. He said, Bhim is stronger and Duryodhana is more skillful. He said, you will not get any result. But then Lord Krishna gave a trick to uh, Bhim. He said, hit him below the belt. Hit him below the belt because that's where he's vulnerable. His body was made like stone by the grace of Gandhari. Gandhari, his mother, had told Duryodhana that you come before me naked. And she took off her blindfold and because she'd been done all that penance and austerities covering her eyes for so long, her eyesight was very powerful and 
the idea was that when she when Duryodhan comes naked in front of her, she will take off her eye, her blindfold and she will look on his body and this way his body will become like stone and it cannot be injured, it cannot be harmed. But Duryodhan came before his mother, he, he was still covering part of his body, he was still cover he was still wearing like uh, his uh, coppins, he was covering himself. Because he was going naked, so Krishna said going naked, he said, why are you